started watching YouTube, trying to figure out different ways to try and navigate myself through the property world. And then I come across one of your videos, clicked the link, went to the crash course, and it was the BRR crash course. After one month of being on the BRR training, I had an offer accepted on my first BRR. That was when I kind of thought like, okay, this is serious. You've got four properties that you control and you own one yeah. property. How much are you making solely on the property business now? About four grand profit a month. I would literally go to work and work my 11 hours and from six to about two o'clock in the morning, I'd stay in my SA and then I'd have about four hours of sleep when I go back to work. So you're thinking if I buy it for 90, spend 25 on it, that's 115, then refinance it, pull out the majority of your money. Buy a bed house for 4,500 pounds, that's sweet. Finn, thanks for coming to my house. We've got quite a lot in common because you're in property full time. You're, well, you're also a boxer, profe just turning professional, but um, you're from Wolverhampton. So uh, talk to me a little bit about how you got into property and, and the boxing and how do you juggle everything as well, man? Well, starting from property, I first got into it when I was about 18. Um, I've always been interested in property, obviously knowing about how landlords have got so many different ones. Obviously, I saved up quite a bit of money. I kind of worked part-time since I was 13. You know, weekends, bank holidays, through the school, Easter holidays, blah, blah, blah. But I kind of saved up money for a long period of time, thinking I was going to get like a buy-to-let mortgage. Then when I first started, when looking around at properties when I was 18, um, I, thought I quickly came to realise how difficult it was to actually get a mortgage. And firstly, at my age, and then secondly, because of obviously how high the prices were. But then I kind of started watching YouTube, trying to figure out different ways to try and navigate myself through the property world. Um, watched a couple different like YouTube people doing property and then I come across one of your videos. I watched like two videos and the first video, I couldn't believe a word you were saying. You was like the one person who was all up in your face, all in the, all in the camera, just so much energy. And I was like, nah, like this can't be, it, it can't be for real. And then the second video, I watched it again and I was like, you know what, I'll just go and do it. Do you know what I mean? And I, I clicked the link, went to the crash course, and it was the BRR crash course. Yeah. Went for the crash course. Thought it was, I didn't think you was going to be there. And then you just rocked up out of nowhere. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was kind of like locked in then. Proper skeptical then, bro. Yeah, yeah. I was really skeptical. Really skeptical. Because obviously you've got your own skeptical mindset, but you've got other people's as well. Yeah. But kind of when I went to the crash course, got there, um, signed up to the BRR training first. After one month of being on the BRR training, I had an offer accepted on my first BRR. And then that was when, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was when I kind of thought like, okay, this is serious. Like this ain't a joke. So that's when I kind of signed up to the academy and I thought that's when, that's when everything kind of started and now, taking place. You know, you've got four properties that you control and you, you own one yeah. property, 19 years old, almost 20 now. You've done a lot. You've got a nice little portfolio. Yeah, what yeah, kind of, how much are you making then? I know you've got your boxing and you're also working part yeah. time. How much are you making solely on the property business now? Solely on the property business. I'm probably making about four grand profit a month. Nice. Which is obviously it, it's really good. It Especially is? for my age, like I'm not finding a wage yeah. that's kind of close to that. Yeah. My age. And you own a property as well. Yeah, yeah, the property I own, that's not making any money yet. That's being refurbed kind of like as we're speaking. Yeah. Um, but that one's going to start, that will net 1.1k profit a month. So that property then, talk to me about that one then. So, yeah. so you come on the training, you see me on YouTube, you come down to the training, you realise that instead of just buying a property to live in, it makes more sense to buy a property investment. Yeah. How did you find it? How did you negotiate it? And, and what, what so, are the figures? I looked around in my own area first, which is Wolverhampton. Um, looked around in Wolverhampton and then kind of just caught, thought of going up north a bit, you know, because it's a cheaper area. And for some reason, I gravitated towards like South Yorkshire. Um, and then I started looking around in Doncaster and I found a property. I went to a lot of viewings. It weren't like one and then that was it. It was a lot of viewings traveling backwards and forwards. And then there was one property that I found in Doncaster. It was obviously really bad condition. Um, it was listed for about 100 grand, but I noticed it was motivated seller. So went to the viewing, offered 80,000, had the offer rejected, and then I put an offer in for 90,000 and it got accepted. So it's still kind of like 10% below market value. And then I was kind of like in a position where like, I didn't, I couldn't, like, I, I couldn't, because I had to pay for it cash. I haven't got the cash. Why didn't you have to pay for it cash? Because it was unmortgageable. It's got, right. it's got no kitchen. It's got, it had no bathroom. 
Yeah. Nothing was working. So no one would touch that. No one would touch it. The person who was living in it before apparently was a witch. So gee. <laughs> so it's like it's one of them things like no one like wanted to touch it at all. So yeah, and then I was kind of in the situation where I needed to raise the finance for it. I was looking deeply into a bridging loan. I had some savings already. How much did you have like from your own money that you From my saved? own money savings, I had about 30K. That's good though, yeah, still. I had 30K. So you, you're one of these, you're one of these kids oh, like me, yeah. not making loads of money, but hustling and whacking yeah, it aside. I would, I would, I, there was a point of time, especially when COVID hit, I was in year 11 when COVID hit or just going into my in sick form. When COVID hit, all the school was kind of like, it was a bit chaotic, mm -hmm. didn't know what was going on. I just literally worked like seven days a week through the whole of COVID. What were you doing? I was doing, um, cause I work for my dad, I work for a family business um, and we was actually doing like, sanitizing on them um, like bin trucks okay because obviously the bin men have been key workers and we was just doing like the sanitizing on them and i was doing that literally seven days a week and i literally saved up. i was avid i'm not as good at saving now but i was an avid saver back then well that what well, motivated you to be such a hard worker such a good saver like what what was it when you were so young like at school I don't, I, I can't really, I don't necessarily know. I think it's just, maybe it might be the people around me, like my granddad, my granddad was a really hard worker. Um, you know, my dad's a hard worker. Maybe it's just the people around me that I've got in my family. That's maybe where I get it from. But I was the same though, when I was at school. Yeah. I used to like iron my money. <laughs> I'd work, I'd, I'd get my, I'd get, I'd sell stuff to the schoolmates and that. They'd give, it, they'd give me money, five pound notes, 10 pounds, I'd get them, iron it, put it in a suit, guys. It got too much, then I put it in the bank. And I used to like be constantly looking at yeah, my money. Yeah, I, I could constantly, it was like, when you, that's the worst thing, putting it in the bank, in a savings account in the bank, and constantly like, it's like you're almost like, like you're, like, you're crowding it. And like, yeah, right, going, but you know what, I think it, for me it might be, what, were you good in school? I got kicked out, but I was good. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you were so good. They kicked you out. I got, no, I got kicked out. I got. Kicked Why did they kick you out? I had a fight because of you know it was just silliness in school. I got kicked out. It was actually. Did one you of, win the fight? Of course I did. There we go. But it was actually one of the best things that kind of happened to me. How old were you when you got kicked out of school? About fifteen. Because if I wasn't gonna say is, when you're not good at anything else, yeah. you're good at fighting. Yeah and you're good at making money. I wasn't good at school. Yeah. And because I was failing at school and I was in trouble and stuff like that, when I realized I'm quite good at making money, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a hard worker. I can make money and I was watching it grow. That was like a game to me. It was like, I'm good at this. And my teacher, when I was 15, she said to me, she saw, I showed her my Bradford and Bingley account. And I was like, look man, I had about two and a half grand in there. She said, that's more money than me. And the self-confidence I got from that, yeah, yeah. So I'm good at this. You know, so maybe I thought it was hundred percent. I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily good at school. Um, you know, I just about passed my GCSE, and I never really liked school either. It weren't my thing, and I was just it, like you say, I hustled hard, grafted, put the put the work in, um, and obviously kind of saved up a lot of money. I tried different investments like crypto. I even started like a stocks and shares ISA. I put it in there, and it's just like it's very long winded. It's gonna take a long time. It's like. What can you do? Like maybe drop shipping, maybe property, maybe Forex. Like what can you actually do? And I thought property, well, I've got a passion for it. And I think it's about investing in something that you you know and you want to kind of learn and you've actually got in, an invested passion for it. Yeah, 100%, 100%. So you get this house in Doncaster, you get it really cheap because it's unmortgageable. Presumably you worked out the GDV before you offered yeah. 90. So how much did you calculate the end value would be? 150. You? Okay, so you work out the end value is 150. How much is the refurb on it? 25. Okay, so you're thinking if I buy it for 90, spend 25 on it, that's 115, then refinance it and pull out majority of your money. I mean, I'd spend about 2,000 on fees as well for like sure. solicitors. So I think I'm leaving in about 4,500. But to me, having a five bed house for 4,500 pound that's sweet, you know? Madness. <laughs> I'm Madness. not complaining about leaving £4,500. How are you going to get the mortgage at the end, though? Because if you're only 19, like, are you old enough to get a mortgage? Well, I am old enough, but obviously there's guarantors you can put on it to make it more accessible as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is one of the big things I had to look at, thinking about kind of like the exit strategy. Now, you looked at bridging, and that was one option, yeah. but you ended up getting yeah, so, an investor. So, Tell me the story. So... I think I think a few people have a bit a bit of stories like this. So you kind of like not pitching the idea. So I was I just happened to talk about how I had this offer accepted on this property, and I started talking about oh because I had family members like uh, my grandparents talking about like oh well are you gonna pay for it? 
essentially. And I was like, well, I'm just going to get a bridging loan on it. You know, I'm just going to get a bridging loan and and then I'll see where I go from there. And it was like, oh, it's risky that is. Risky. <laughs> <laughs> risky, risky that is. Yeah, what are we doing that? And I was like, well, I started talking about the deal. I started talking about, oh, it's going to be this. It's going to be a five bed HMO or SA. I'm going to leave like £4,500 in it. You know, it's a really big house, blah, blah, blah. Pour it for 90. And I just explained it. And then at the end, I'm talking about bridging. They're like, oh, that's risky. And I was like, well, how am I going to afford it? And then because they heard me talk about all the kind of pros of what it's going to be, and I wasn't directly saying to them, oh, put the money into this. This is what it's going to be. I was just talking about it openly. Uh-huh. It was like, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the money for it. We'll loan you the money. And it's like, well, I said, if you loan me the money, I'll give you kind of like five to seven and a half percent on whatever you give me. And they was happy with it because it's better than what they're getting paid in the bank. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So they was happy with it and they was investing in, they was putting the money into me, which they thought was kind of like, you know, an opportunity to see me like take that and watch it grow and maybe invest in the future. Yeah. See how well that does. Exactly. And and that's that's also and that's the thing. So many people think, oh, I need an investor, I need an investor. But there's people right under their yeah, nose. Literally, literally. There's so many people. It could be like aunties, grandparents, cousins, like your friend, your friend's dad. It could be anyone. There's so many people who have like got liquid cash and they've just got it sitting in the bank doing nothing and they're desperate. Yeah. Desperate to put it in something, but they don't have anyone to trust or they don't know what to do with it. So what tips would you give then? Because this is a very delicate issue. Yeah. When you're trying to get family members, because so many people have got grandparents, yeah. parents, aunties, uncles that have got a bit of money. How do you delicately broach the subject without? Um, I'd probably say maybe don't directly pitch to them. Maybe just talk about what you actually want them to invest in openly where you're just kind of talking about it. Or maybe get their opinion on it. Maybe get like, what do you think about this? Yeah. Like, do you reckon this is a good idea? Do you yeah. think this is like a pretty good like investment? When they start talking about how good of an investment it's going to be for you, they're going to think, well, oh, maybe I can be a part of this. Because they've just been talking about all the pros for you. Yeah. And then they've kind of cycled it in their head where they're like, oh, this is good, this is. Yeah. I wish I could do something It's like kind this. of getting them on board with the ambition, isn't it? As opposed to, can you invest in my yeah. deal? Yeah. Another thing that you did is you took the plunge first, joined the academy, found the deal, put an offer on, had the offer accepted before you got the money, which is risky, but that's interesting that you did that. Why did you go that way around? Why did you not get you the money lined up first so, and then go forward? So one thing is with me, I'm kind of like, I'm not as bad now, but I was very kind of like, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Yeah. Like, and, and I think that's a good thing in a way, but it's also a bad thing as well because it, it can it can lead to where you get in sticky situations. But it's a good thing because you're not one of those people who will take in a lot of information or learn about things and then not take any action. Yeah. I was kind of one of them where, all right, boom, join the academy, learn what I've got to learn, and then just go out and implement it. How did you afford to join the academy? Is that from your savings? Savings, yeah. How did you justify the decision to join the... It's, it's a big investment. Yeah. How did you as a young kid... Just to be fair, part of it, I don't know, kind of like when I was making the decision, what made me um, join necessarily. But a big thing was, I take it back to fighting, my boxing. Like I'm not going to go fight in a ring if I've not had a coach training me for four, six, seven, eight weeks. Yeah. So I thought, well, if I'm going to go buy a house, I shouldn't go into it without a coach training me in property yeah. for a couple of months or something. Using that mindset is what got me into getting trained. I thought I'd never fight without being trained right. or having a coach in my corner. And the academy is like having a coach in your corner, yeah. but for property. You know what I mean? You've got the mentors, you got you, you've got the training. Yeah. It, that's what kind of- It makes sense. A good idea. It makes sense. And I think it's the, it's the case of every profession. You wouldn't be an electrician without going to college or a doctor without going to uni. No, so it just makes sense to get trained. And you've got this one deal, which is amazing, but you've also got four rent to rents and you're scaling up as well doing bigger stuff so how how did you get into the rent to rent side i think um yeah so kind of like when i got the brr because the brr was the first one um i realized like kind of like okay i've got this now but it's gonna take a bit of time so i was thinking well maybe i should start looking at rent to rents and rent to essays um so i started looking and it was really difficult like i struggled with that more than the brr the brr took a bit of time to you know, get it lined up, get a view in, and then get an offer accepted where it was the worth the actual price. Uh, but with the rent to rents, it was so difficult. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. Like, partly because of my age as well, because, like, I think it's a bit difficult for people to take you seriously when you're, you're 19. But 
you can also make it, I think eventually I actually got it to play in my favor. Um, I must have made about 180 phone calls before I got my first rent to rent. Damn. Yeah. 180 actual conversations or dials? Like 180 like conversations. And you got rejected or did they just fob you off? I got rejected like every time. Yeah. It, was, it was it was either rejections or I actually got to the viewing and they went with someone else's application. But after that, it's kind of like you get like this burning like fire inside here where you're like, well, why are they saying, what, why am I getting this many no's? Like you see people getting their essays and you're like, well, why am I? What did you think when you're on the academy and every week on the mastermind? Yeah. There's people saying like, Oh, I just got three deals, and and you're like, what? Yeah, it's it, obviously you like people seeing people's success, and it motivates you. But at the same time, it kind of like breaks you. <laughs> it's like, like it breaks, and you're like looking, and you're like, he's got like three, five rent essays. I've got nothing. Yeah, I've been on it like near enough the same time he has. Like, what am I doing wrong? And it's like, well, you know, you get this fire inside here, this burning fire, and you're like, well, oh, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go balls through the walls and just go for it. And I kind of just ended up going into, walking into letting agent offices, talking to them. And I used my age in my favor, essentially, because I was kind of like, I was that confident. I just made myself, even though I had no like rent essays, I thought, well, I've got a BRR. Yeah. I've got a BRR. I've got some experience. Yeah. Like I was thinking like, well, what would a 19 year old has got like a property? So I thought like, you know what? I'm just going to use this in my, take it in my stride. And that's what gave me the confidence then. I would walk in there, like borderline just arrogant. Like yeah. that's what you gotta be. You gotta be like borderline, like so cocky. Yeah. Because letting agents will kind of actually like it because they think so like much that you're, you know what you're talking about. And there's not a doubt in their mind that you're gonna mess anything up. And they kind of buy into you. And that's what happened. I kind of, I got my first rent to rent through a letting agent because of those reasons. Um, and I asked that let, letting agent a couple of months afterwards, Kind of like why he gave me that property. That's great market research. I, I asked him why he gave me the property. What did he say? Um, so I asked him why he gave me the property. I said, look, look what made you give it me in the end? Because I had nothing. <laughs> 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 and he, he was like, he just said to me, he said to me, it wasn't the fact, because he said, we got a lot of applications and we always get a lot of applications for people wanting to do rent to rents and we get like big companies come to us. But he said, it was the fact that it was like you as an individual like mm. we was kind of putting our faith into you because we liked you. Interesting. We we trusted you, and you know we thought we'll take a chance, and it it worked out really well. And I think that's what it is. I think people don't invest in your company, your business model. They invest more so in you mm. as a person. Do you know mm. what I mean? And it's interesting that you said about the, you've got the BRR. You, and I I often say this about when you when you're trying to get like rent yeah. to rent or you're going in cold. You've got to think, what have I got going for me? Yeah. Rather than thinking, I'm 19, I haven't got this, I haven't got this, I haven't got this. I think, well, what have I got? Put your best foot forward. Put your best foot forward. How did you get around the referencing with the, with your first The referencing, you like, I had to get a guarantor. Um, I had to use, I, again, I had to use my nan. To did, be a guarantor. She's a legend, by yeah, the way. legend, legend. I was talking to her the other day, I owe, I owe so much. So all, I think a lot of people have their motivations of why they do stuff. But I think the biggest one for me will always be family. Yeah, yeah. I think that's another reason what got me to kind of work so hard mm -hmm. is to just like, like just pay about family and just give them kind of like everything back what they've given me in the yeah. past. That first rent to rent, where was it? Birmingham. Birmingham. And was it an apartment, a house? A house. It was a big house. Was it? Yeah, it was a, it's a four bed house. So how do you rent it? Do you rent it room by room? Or no, you no, no, no. no. I, rent, I rent the whole thing. It's a four bed house. It's pretty much a five. It's really big. It's pretty much like a five bed. How much do you pay to the landlord? 1200 that sounds good, you know. It is. It is a good price. So I pay it twelve hundred, um, and that makes this month it'll make about three grand profit. Last month it made two and a half grand. What? Yeah, but that's what it's probably going to make for the next couple of months now because what? I, I had I had a direct booking from a bunch of like contractor workers. How do you market it? When do you put it? So I think one thing is what people do wrong with essays. Um, is that they just fling it on booking.com and Airbnb and just forget about it. Yeah. But that's like complete opposite of what you've got to do. You've got to put it on booking.com and Airbnb. Then you've got to monitor it on booking.com and Airbnb every single day. Right. And see others in the area as well who might be doing better yours. Look at what they're doing. But then you've got to, there's so many other online travel agencies that you've got to put it on. And then there's also obviously sending brochures out to companies and whatnot, ringing up companies. One thing as well that I do 
is when someone books through Airbnb or booking.com, ring them, ring them and ask them why they're staying. Mate, I love that. Especially if someone's booking for like a week because they might, because it, it goes back to this, someone booked that full bed house for a week and I rang them and I said, well, how come, how come you're staying? Like, what's going on? They said, well, we're doing some work in the area. I said, oh, okay, like, how come you've only booked a week? They said, oh, she couldn't find any more availability. Like, I couldn't understand why that was. I think there was like one booking, like a couple of weeks afterwards. But all I ended up doing was I spoke to that person. I said, look, like, sorry, we can't accommodate. It was only like for like two nights, so it wasn't a big deal. Cancelled that. And then they ended up booking the whole thing then. And it started, just call them. Because that one booking could have lost me like three months. Yeah. Worth of a direct booking. Yeah. Which is like, it, all because of a phone call. Also, you can ring them and you can say, you can find out what the company they work for. Contact the company. Yeah. I'm sure you do that. Yeah. Thing is with that, there's also companies that are contracted to other companies. Yeah. So you don't want to ring the company that they're contracted to. You want to call the company that's subcontracting them. Because they're the ones who are traveling down right. and staying. Would you say most of your guests are contractors? Yeah, 100%. What, what about your other properties? How many? you got four rentamates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my other two, there's one in the city center and then there's another one in Birmingham as well. The city center one, that's more like general, kind of like executive business people and business travelers. So each one has got its own market, its own yeah. demographic. Well, two of, the, two of them, because I've got two four beds, they're both contractors, because I tend to find that the big ones are just contractors. And then the smaller ones, more of like your executive kind of like business travelers, like maybe bankers, maybe like international people. What does your nan think of how much money you're making on these deals? <laughs> she just thinks she's, I don't know, she just thinks she's a bit mad to be honest. Does she? she obviously she's proud, but when I tell her, she's just like, you know, it's just a bit mad. I don't think people can believe it when I tell them. It's my, my mum mainly is like a bit like, <laughs> cause she got, cause she kind of like, I made her like a bit like a PA in a way, like where she checks on my emails. Cause I'm really bad with emails. And obviously I'll get like statements and bookings come through of like how much a booking was worth on my emails. And she'll see all these emails <laughs> coming through of like 800 pound, 1.6K, 3K, all this stuff. And it's like, Actually, she's seeing this and it's just like she's coming to me and she's like oh your board's going up now <laughs> <laughs> and it's like yes it is what it is isn't it so how much time do you spend on property versus your job versus your boxing so with my job i was spending like 11 hours out of my day to go do my work when i was full time boxing when i'm not training for a fight i'll train like you know once a day when i am training for a fight it's twice a day so boxing takes us some time. And then property, I was kind of dedicating like two or three hours a day when I was working. But one difficult thing I had was when I got my first rent to SA, I was still in full-time work. And this is one thing you'll have to do when you get your rent to rents. And you've got to understand this. Is I would literally go to work, I'd work my 11 hours. I'd get back about six o'clock. And from six to about two o'clock in the morning, I'd stage my SA, get it all furnished and whatnot. And then I had about four hours of sleep and I go back to work. So you have to be willing to put in the work. Yeah, man. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Especially when you're doing boxing, yeah, yeah, yeah. job, and property on top. How has it been on the academy? What's the experience of the academy been like? In my opinion, I don't see how people can do it without the academy. Like I get a lot of people coming to me from like one pound events because I still go there for the networking. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just a sick environment. Yeah. You get a lot of people come up to you from like the black badge events and the one pound events. And I genuinely can't like understand how they can do like all, all the all the strategies or, or grow a business without it. You know what I mean? You need that kickstart, you need the mentors, you need the coaching in place to get you where you want to be. And the network, man. The network. You made so many friends. It's like, for example, I'm going into SA management now and there's a lot of people on the academy who could do with like someone like me who's got the expertise with SAs to manage their properties or just in general, like Facebook marketplace the other networking events. It just allows you so much opportunity to grow as a business, to grow as a person, yeah. to network, to actually have friends as well. <laughs> I'm getting like a few friends just out of the academy because yeah. it's like-minded people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? How did you find the Accelerated Coaching Performance Program last month? That was sick. In my opinion, that's worth like all of the money alone. To the academy, you mean? Yeah, like all the money alone, like just that. Why was that so valuable? Because it's just like, it's a thorough breakdown of kind of like what you need to do with your business. Because when you're doing your property business, when you've got it to a certain level, you know, you've got a couple of rent to rents, maybe you've got a BRO, maybe a lease option. You kind of don't know what the next steps are. You don't know whether you should be carrying on doing what you're doing. You don't know whether you should change strategies. 
You don't know whether you should implement different things. And it's like, you have so many different ideas in red, but with you, when you go to the ACPP, you kind of direct and have that tunnel vision from you to yeah, where, yeah. what you need to do. It's about having a business Yeah, plan. and that's all you need. You need someone to kind of direct you and tell you what you need to do. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to connect? Instagram, so Instagram is underscore Finn Cooper and probably Facebook as well, which is just Finley Cooper. And yeah, that's probably the best. Awesome. And I always say to people, if they want to connect with me, Best thing is to come down to the Property Investor Crash Course. One pound. You'll probably see me there as well. Do some networking. You'll probably see me there as well. Respect, brother. Nice one. I hope you was inspired listening to that. Connect with Finley. Come and meet us at the Property Investors Crash Course where you can spend one day learning everything condensed into a day about property investment and how you can get started. Tickets are one pound, but they're limited. So get booked now. I'll leave a link in the description and I'll see you there.